This is Elder England. At least that's what he used to be called. Between 2016 and 2018, he served as a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the Alpine German-speaking mission. Now known simply as Toby, he is returning to come to terms with the country where he spent two years teaching a faith he no longer believes in. This search for meaning amongst the breathtaking Swiss scenery would involve meeting old friends and making new ones, all in the pursuit of gaining perspective on the Mormon rite of passage that is a two-year mission. Our first stop was a Thrive event, a place where those who have left the faith can discuss their shared experiences of Mormonism. And when I was filling in my form to serve a mission, I mentioned that my grandmother was German, I have German ancestors, as much as humanly possible, because I was hoping that would help them to send me here. <laughs> Every single transfer day, the missionaries from all over Switzerland will come here because it's the easiest place to get people in and out of Switzerland. And as you can see, people bring, bring their luggage. And the missionaries kind of take over, right? The, the very, this is the centre of the train station. And the missionaries will just dump all their stuff there, hang out all day there, without even caring that nobody really wants them there, uh, without, really caring, uh, without really caring how much uh, space they take up. And I was miserable at the time, because I've been in my area for a very long time, and it was kind of struggling there, it felt very old, there wasn't a lot going on, very quiet place, um, and the last companion that I had before this, I had a really difficult time with. Um, it was also really cold, it was minus 16 one day, and we were knocking on doors. Um, yeah, that was, a, that was a, an interesting time, but a beautiful time. What we didn't expect on the day of Thrive was to receive a tip that there would be a group of missionaries involved in an Ausstellung, a large street display involving missionaries from up to 40 miles away. These two kindly agreed to be filmed and to chat with us about how the missionary work and rules have changed since Toby was there. A lot has changed. A lot has changed. Yeah, <laughs> Covid kind of took a hit on the mission. No way! Never would have guessed that. <laughs> yeah, so in terms of the rules, uh, you know, split finding, going mm -hmm. out on your own as long as you're on the main street. Yeah. Because most of the time missionaries are going up and down. Yep, you heard that right. Not only was the missionary on the right not wearing a tie as part of a local casual finding initiative, but Mormon missionaries, who are known for strictly sticking to their companionships, are now splitting up on the streets to double their efforts. But that was actually something that had already started during Toby's time as a missionary. This is one stretch of the city where I definitely spent most of my time doing street finding. Along this little stretch here between the tram station and just behind us over there is a busy train station. So there'd be constantly people walking past almost all the way through the day and we'd just be stopping people as we talked. I don't know what it's like in other missions, but in my mission they developed this technique, split finding, where you wouldn't be talking together so that you were outnumbering the people you were talking to, but you'd walk separate to each other. You'd say that you were going to stay within sight and sound because that's what it says in the handbook, but almost no one actually followed that. You'd be sometimes a good 20, 30 meters apart. You have no idea what your companion is talking about, but that way you get to talk to double the people and you're increasing the the efficiency of your work. But to be honest, now in hindsight, these people are trying to usually get from the train to the tram so they can go somewhere else. And now it kind of feels almost like harassing people when they're busy trying to get somewhere. So it didn't feel like that at the time? At the time, no, it didn't feel like that. We just thought, oh, we found the perfect place to catch people when they're really busy. There's going to be lots of people so we can talk to as many people as possible and spread the good word. But returning to a mission isn't just about the missionary work. We'd arranged for Toby to meet someone significant from his time as a missionary. How are you feeling about meeting Mark? I'm looking forward to it. It's always fun meeting people that you meet as a missionary because when you're not a missionary, then it's funny because you are the same person but also a different person. It's like mm -hmm. a different context with meeting them, but it's also interesting to get to know someone while you're not being a missionary. Because everyone you meet is a missionary, you're meeting because you are a missionary. Right. Now I'm meeting him simply because he's someone that I know. Okay. So. But away from, from that, the fact that he used to be a bishop. Yeah, that's, that's strange, but not in a bad way. Because mm -hmm. the relationship that I had with, with him was obviously he was someone that I sort of answered to in a way, right? The missionary. Mm -hmm. The missionary work in a in a ward you kind of answer to the bishop and you meet and you talk with the bishop about it and now um i don't have any of those responsibilities i um i'm here simply as a as a person mark prohaska was toby's bishop in the winter tour ward 
and whilst he still attends church occasionally and finds joy in its community, like many, he has serious and substantial questions about the church and its history. While we didn't record the meeting, we did have a chance to catch up with Toby afterwards and get his thoughts. It was great seeing Mark. Um, so he invited us over to his house and he had some of his family there and we talked, we got to catch up and talk about all sorts of different things. It's been, what, it's been five years since I've seen him and the last time I was in that house was Christmas of 2017. He invited me and my companion over and we spent Christmas with his whole family and it was honestly that that Christmas was one of these really beautiful highlight moments um, of my mission and so being back there seeing these same people years later and just still feeling all of that warmth all of that kindness and love was just yeah just absolutely amazing it's not just the people that Toby came to love in Basel where he spent six months of his mission we sat down to talk about his experiences of Swiss culture obviously missionaries don't go out and enjoy the nightlife they're <laughs> stuck inside but how do you find interacting with cultural events here in Basel was probably the most Swiss cultural event possible to, uh, to get to enjoy. It's called Fasnacht. In Germany it's known as Fasching, and in Austria too. And it's this massive parade where people dress up and they parade through the streets all day. And it normally lasts a couple of days. And it just so happens that it was on P-Day, so we did get to enjoy that. But then other things are going on while you're working and you just have to walk past and keep going. You know that you're the foreigner when you come here as a missionary, but then you live, your, you live here long enough that it doesn't feel that foreign anymore. So you do get to enjoy it. You get to pick, pick up little bits of slang and different phrases that are unique to different areas. But then that's easier in a larger city when there's a lot more going on, more cultural events, more people. In a smaller place, it's not so, uh, it's not so easy. But Fastnacht isn't the only thing that's been in Basel for a long time. We've got the ward building here in Basel, very different to most other churches. It's a very, very old building. Um, the church's headquarters for Switzerland and I think Europe used to be in Basel. So the, the church has been here for a while. They ran a, a ward talent competition, not competition, talent show, just so various different people could perform and show off different talents. And they asked the missionaries to do something and um, I play a bit of guitar and like to sing and so I said I could play something but I said I don't know any mission appropriate songs and uh, the guy running it said it's fine just do anything as long as it's not bad. Uh, <laughs> so I got to go up and, and play music on the stage which is something that I used to do I used to do a lot before my mission and that was a that was a moment where I almost forgot that I was a missionary just because I was doing something just so normal, just so, um, just so fun. But then there was the tiniest amount of guilt that I wasn't performing a song that was part of the, the few songs that missionaries are, are allowed to listen to, or at least as it was when I was, when I was here. Basel is obviously quite a big city, very international city, and so we had members and sometimes investigators who um, didn't speak German and they usually get the elders to translate so you'd have a microphone that was feeding into headsets that all the members who um, spoke English would be wearing and you just translate all of the meetings but then obviously there are some topics that might come up which are well maybe the investigators haven't heard of yet and I remember one uh, test fast and testimony meeting where a member was bearing their testimony about how they had come to terms with the history of the church and polygamy and we had, I think, two or three, maybe even three investigators there. And I knew, oh, we haven't talked about that at all. How do I translate that? So I ended up just saying something completely different so that I didn't end up talking about polygamy to these investigators who'd only just started finding out about the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith's first vision and all of those things. Before you can get investigators into church buildings, though, first you have to find them. If they weren't at the tram stop, missionaries would go to universities. Students far from home and looking for community can make ideal candidates for missionary work. One of the places we'd often come to find, because street finding was preferred over door knocking, was a place like this, ETH. It's called, for good reason, the MIT of Europe. It's a really good university. and We just walk around here stopping students as they were going to and from class. And before the construction work, you could sit down and say, hey, why don't we just talk for a minute here and get out of people's way? But clearly right now you can't do that. 
There's a, a loop that you can walk around the main university building just in a square that only takes just more than five minutes. And so we would sometimes come up, up here to do street finding, stopping people on the street because that you'd usually be full of students, there'd be lots of people about, but we'd be catching them between their lectures and they often didn't have a lot of time. And we'd be stopping them and asking them if they had a moment. We had a couple of questions we wanted to ask them about faith or religion, these sorts of things. And we would just do laps, essentially stopping, stopping people as we were going along. When the weather was bad, when it was cold or raining, we would sometimes come inside the university, even though clearly not supposed to, and we'd teach, we'd teach some students, even though they were studying at a different part of uh, with a different faculty. But this, on these steps roughly, is uh, the last time I saw um, a, an American-German girl that we taught during my time here in Zurich. And actually, since coming home and since um, deciding to leave the church, I got back in contact with her and talked about the experience of being a missionary. And then we became friends, and that was something quite healing for me. Um, even apologising to her for the pressure that we were putting, under, putting on her as missionaries. As you can see, there's a lot of church towers um, behind me here, looking down over Zurich. Um, a couple of them are Protestant, some are Catholic. Switzerland is a, definitely a mixture of both. And although obviously there are lots of people nowadays who are atheists or agnostic and don't see themselves as religious, the history of religion here is very, very strong and people are very um, clued in and very knowledgeable when it comes to faith and spirituality. There's a big statue down by the river of one of the great reformers, Twingli, who was Swiss. So coming and teaching people about this new religion, well, most people either had a very strong faith or they had a very good reason, very knowledgeable reason why they had decided not to believe in anything. Of course, some people were open to talking and these conversations could clearly leave an impression. One of the definite teaching highlights of my mission was right here. Um, me and my companion were here on a Sunday, walking up and down the streets. Um, Sundays, nothing's usually open, and so there are some people out and about relaxing, but generally lots of people will stay at home. And so we were really struggling to find people who would actually stop and talk to us. And we did, exactly what missionaries normally do. We prayed very sincerely that we would be able to find someone who would be willing to talk and we'd be able to have a good conversation with them. And the next person that we stopped was, uh, was an American guy, actually. And he was flying, I think, literally a couple of hours later back to the States or somewhere else. He was backpacking across Europe. And um, we just said, hey, well, if you've got time for a chat, why don't you come, why don't we sit down and talk? And since we were in such a beautiful place. We came down here to this, uh, this spot. I was sat somewhere here. He was across from me and my companion was, was there on the steps. And he opened his heart and soul up to these two complete strangers. He was telling us he grew up kind of religious, but had fallen away somewhat, didn't know what to do, didn't know um, about believing in God and asked us about our experiences. What convinced us that we should come out here and be missionaries? And so we talked, I think it was about an hour as the sun was setting. It was dark by the time that we finished talking and we probably needed to, to head back to the, the apartment because it was curfew. That moment definitely stayed with me. And I noticed as a missionary, even at the time I was aware of the fact that I was, I never wanted to be dishonest to people, but I also wanted to paint things in the best possible light in terms of how strong my testimony was, why I was here as a missionary. That, um, But I also wanted to, explain things in a way that it would make people open to that. I've come here and if I hadn't have had even the tiniest of desire to come here, don't, don't get me wrong, I, I wouldn't have been here. When I first considered it, I was kind of just like... And listening back to that video now, it, it doesn't sound as convincing as I think I thought it was in that moment. And But that's it, you've got 18, 19, 20 year olds doing what is supposed to be the most important work on the planet, um, bringing salvation to people. And that's, that's heavy, that's a, that's a heavy and difficult load to, to carry. Having now spent a week in Switzerland, I wanted to know how he was feeling about coming back. Something that I've definitely struggled with is the fact that I'd never been to Switzerland before my mission, so Switzerland was associated with my mission. 
I've always loved German, always wanted to speak it, but I didn't learn it and didn't speak it until my mission. So I associate both things very much with, with my mission and therefore with being a member of the church. But then coming back here helped to, helped to make both things more of my own. Less so experiences that belonged to the church and more so experiences now being made that definitely, definitely belong to me. As we sat high in the Swiss mountains, reflecting on what it is to be Mormon, I realised we all process our Mormon life differently. For some, it looks like leaving. For others, it's trying to stay and fix what's broken. But ultimately, we must confront what it means to have been Mormon and decide how much of it we wish to keep with us. It seems I am dangerous to all that come near Stubborn as sorrow and fickle as fear Off in the distance is where I will be Some place unknown where the sky meets the sea But woman, I'm written on the back of your hand There's something between us, it burns just like sand In the wound of our love, please just put me to sleep At the place where my heart and your apathy Lay me to rest where the pines used to be Held in your hand like a shell from the sea Tempted by fire but muddied by clay I'll keep to myself like the close of the day But lover, you said I have eyes born to see They're as sad as a whale song and blue as the deep If I told you I'm scared of becoming myself Would you find only joy in the sum of my wealth? Lost to the memories that flow in my blood Scared of the echoes that whisper of love Measuring joy by the pull of the tide I learned long ago not to trust in the lie When father you told me that I am just the same As the fools who let fortune and life take the blame So spare me your stories, it's not worth the time With the breath that you waste you could smother my life Father, you told me the world isn't holy I need even just one good friend So I'll keep to myself, put my fears on the shelf Till the sky holds its own weight again